what are the key components of human intelligence that AI cannot replicate? And why are these elements important? Do you think that, for instance, AI systems could be better designed to understand and incorporate cultural contexts? That's already sort of effectively what's happened with ChatGPT. Um, it's pretty, it's very capable of emulating what seem like human empathy and human feelings. I think that the problem, the, the ultimate problem is that it's not actually subject to, it doesn't have to sit there like Paula Venels does, accounting for itself in front of an inquiry. Um, you know, whether people think she's doing that well or not, it just doesn't have to do it. And in fact, it can be an excuse for a future CEO of a company to sort of say, well, the computer told me this, and so therefore I did it. Which, by the way, I mean, this isn't new. This is also how we use process in companies. Companies are constantly sort of saying, well, that was the process. We just followed it, and that was the regulation. And this is, this is useful. Let's be clear. This is useful. This is why modern economies have become efficient, because doing the moral work of constantly looking at someone and sort of saying, well, actually, I'm a bit short of money in my company and I need to lay off some employees and I'm going to do that as a human being with my personal relationships with those people and knowing that they might have a young family or something like that. The moral burden of that at scale is enormous. And what actually happens if there aren't processes, humans give up, they just cut out their moral thinking and make really bad decisions. So the way we work in modern liberal democracies is to prevent that happening, we have processes, we have laws, laws that date back to the invention of writing, the code of Hammurabi and before sort of, you know, 1700 years uh, BC, which support us in managing larger ecosystems. And they sort of replace this sort of sense of moral duty with a process that we've agreed upon and there's some way of criticizing the process. And you can see what's going on with the machine is just more of the same. Then this is where one of the things I talk about in the book, Anora O'Neill's uh, wreath lectures from uh, about 20 years ago called The Question of Trust, which sort of look at what that process has to look like in order to be considered trustworthy. And it has to have intelligent accountability, as she calls it, which is explain humans explaining how and why it works. So we need to bring the technology closer to human beings. And that sort of sense of empathy, this is the sort of really interesting interface. This is where things, I think, get very difficult and our understanding is very poor. We don't understand how humans mislead and manipulate each other in conversations that well. We can see certain humans are good at it. We don't understand how some humans over social media do it very well. You know, I don't normally reference science fiction, but there's in the, there's the um, Foundation trilogy, there's this notion of the mule. The mule is this human being that is really good at manipulating other human beings, right? And you can imagine us creating a version of ChatGPT that's like that. And, and that's the kind of dystopian future. And that will happen because people are creating these technologies in a way where they're incentivized to make money for themselves. It won't happen because people are evil and scheming. Or maybe it will be, but even if people aren't evil and scheming, you know, this will just happen because companies can make money by manipulating people to do things they didn't know what to do. So we have to get on top of identifying where and when that's happening. And that requires a much deeper understanding of human psychology and the empathy you're talking about. Now, to the extent that that is happening, the embodied nature less so, robotics is way behind this form of conversation. And the reason robotics is way behind, and this is really ironic, as I point out in the book, the first thing that came about, you know, with our nervous system, it's about movement. It's about sensing and action. So the sensorics and the nervous system evolve together. And so there's this sort of enormous irony that, you know, the, the abilities of almost every animal on the planet far exceed the abilities of our robots in order to do actions in the real world. And they came first, you know, they're sort of evolving hundreds of millions of years ago. The brain that we're thinking of is special to us. You know, we're a bit like the elephant. The elephant must go, well, it's all about noses. It's all about noses. You know, look at this. They can't do that with their nose. Look what I can do with my nose, you know. And we're kind of a bit like that with our neocortex. It's all about the frontal cortex. Well, yes, it's great. The frontal cortex is great. But actually, the stuff that comes before the frontal cortex is really, really hard for us to do. So to build a machine that has the same embodied experience of the world, I think is quite a long way off. But interestingly, we didn't need that 
for the machine to start having a sense of it because it's read what we've written. Now, one of the things that's known with ChatGPT is that sometimes it makes quite clumsy mistakes about body shapes and things like that because we don't tend to write much about those things because they're so innate to us that we don't tend to talk about them. I mean, I think it's called the Hemingway style of writing, the iceberg writing. You only write what you want to communicate. You can leave the rest to the imagination. And most of the time we can leave what's going on with the body to the imagination. And the computer therefore can't read about that. So it doesn't know about that. But despite that minimal information, people have already started showing that it has quite a good sense of embodiment, even just from reading our text. You know, it's not sensing it in the same way as us. This is one of the key points I try and make. I call these things human analog machines, meaning that they don't compute as we do, but they compute in ways that are analogous to the way we're computing. That's what gives us a good sense of their ability to talk to them. And I think that, well, I think the really interesting thing, I mean, so about 10 years ago, there was a panel session with myself, Joshua Bengio, uh, Demis Hasebis, Jürgen Schmidt, who Uber and Max Welling was chairing it. Uh, this was at ICML and, and Jürgen was speaking before me and Jürgen said something that I, you know, I felt was a bold prediction at the time. And actually he's turned out to be, I think broadly right in the sense in which I think he met it, meant it. He said, and, and one can argue this because these aren't well-defined concepts. I've already criticized that. But he said, you know, in 10 years time, we'll have something around the ability of a capuchin monkey. Now, I've already argued that the that this is an odd thing to talk about. But I, I certainly would have been a bit surprised if it's, you know, it's not an ability, the ability of a capuchin monkey, but we do have something that can plausibly converse, doing it in a very different way to humans do. But my immediate response is the one thing I'm sure we won't have is any robot that can do what a capuchin monkey does to climb a tree or swing around like a gibbon does or hover like, oh, you can see I'm a bit obsessed with Kez. Um, I had to read it as a kid, just thought it was an amazing book, but hover like a kestrel does by the side of a road looking for a vole and nowhere near it, nowhere near it. And I said that at the time and, you know, th these progressions always seem to go slow, 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 and then very rapid perceptually, I mean, that's not what's happening underneath. So the public people will be like, oh, ChatGPT came from nowhere. It didn't. You know, we'd all seen it coming. We didn't know when it would cross the threshold that would wow the public. And, and that's the perception of a very rapid advance, that it crossed this threshold that, that it gets to a certain level of quality that back. Now, in robotics, we're not even seeing those sort of first signs that, oh, we just need to keep going that direction and we'll cross the threshold and the public will be wowed because we'll have a flying kestrel thing. Uh, we're, we're more where it felt like we were sort of in about 2005 with these machine learning technologies. We can do some things that, that we're excited about and seem impressive, but we'll just seem a little bit embarrassing or seem a little bit embarrassing from the perspective of the kestrel or the gibbon. So that fundamental embodied intelligence, what I call fast reacting or ref, um, reflexive intelligence in the book is something we're a very long way off. And one of the interesting things about the human being is that that's an integral part of our intelligence, that that's the primary intelligence, that what our reflexive, uh, reflective intelligence does, or the slow reacting intelligence does, is kind of mop up the decisions that the fast reacting intelligence has already made. So by the time something gets to our brain and we're thinking about it, you know, if it's something like falling over or running from a wolf or avoiding a sort of falling rock, uh, you know, the time, by the time it gets to our prefrontal cortex, those decisions have already been made and the prefrontal cortex is, is just sort of mopping up. But we get this sort of user illusion, this observer bias, that because our slow reacting intelligence is the thing that we spend all our time with by definition, because we're wandering around thinking, oh, wonder about this, wonder about that. You know, we tend to think that that's the dominant part. But it, when it comes to looking at decisions, uh, you know, made in our body, it's all about these fast decisions. And and they've come about through this process of evolution that has been, well, if you don't do that well, you die, so you don't exist. Um, and that's very, very different to the intelligence that we've built, which is um, not 
not as robust in the same way. It's a very fragile intelligence. It, it falls over very quickly because it's not been exposed to this environment for hundreds of millions of years. That so basically, if you don't react, then you'll disappear and you won't reproduce.